buongiorno principessa. It's me, Jimmy, with my wife, and Kelly. <laughs> Why do you uh, sound like Mario? We welcome you to, uh, to the episode of Clary. Because, Kelly, you've always got to have an angle. Right. You've got mm. in, in the entertainment industry, what you got to understand is you got to come at it with a fresh take. And, and so I just so it's Italy today, you know. Uh, and why is it Italy? It's Italy. Uh, that doesn't make just, any sense. You just got to and you, and you got to find it as you go. Italy, find what? I, I, Italian, Italy, country of Italy, uh, shaped like a boot, boot. Uh, boot kicks things, kick them while they're down, down on the ground. Job's down on hmm. the ground. Uh, boot kicking Job. Oh, suffering Job. Italy accent. There you go. And there you go. And so welcome to a clearly. We're wow. so glad that you would join us today. That was today. a stretch there. It was a stretch, but it was um, a brilliant stretch. I might Can have... we be honest that you just love accents? And we accents? are so uh, glad to be with you today in we this are. episode. Yes. This episode today is brought to you by our friends at Better Man. You can check them out at betterman.com. That's betterman.com. Kelly, what are we doing today? What are we looking at? Well, we're getting into the book of Job, the first couple of chapters, and just kind of getting a lay of the land. If you've never read this book, it is kind of a wild opening to a book. And there's things happening in earth. There's things happening in the heavens. Mm -hmm. God and Satan are happening. There's interacting. There's Job and his life. And this episode, we're just going to deal with what's happening on the ground. We're going to look at what happened. Who is this man, Job? What happened in his life? Why is that significant? And eventually next week, we're going to get to what's happening in the heavens. But today is just ground level what is happening in this man's life and why should we pay attention to that? So we're going to be answering some of uh, uh, the big questions around that. Stick with us mm -hmm. and it'll give us a good orientation for the whole rest of the season. Yes. Uh, we hope uh, you enjoy it. Here we go. <music> Kelly, this has been an insane week. Uh, it has been. For both of us. That it's is been true. an insane day for both of us. It's been, I've been in studio all day. That is true. Which has to music coming. Oh snap, mm. what's happening, yo? But we can't talk about that. <laughs> uh, but you're but this is your baby tonight. You walk Yeah, I told Jimmy I was like, hey, I got this. Baby us. Chill. What? Wait, I don't know. I that, bet those two analogies that came to that didn't make sense. That doesn't okay, make sense. That's okay. Fine. Here we so go. we're in the book of Job and we are in the very beginning and we need some lay of the land here. So that's on the agenda tonight is this book is long and it's building on the first couple of chapters. And so we're going to answer um, a, uh, the main question that we're going to answer tonight is who is Job? Nailed it. <laughs> and what happened to Job? Well, it's <laughs> going to be a short episode. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to look at Job and his no good, terrible, very bad day. I see what you did there. Days, plural. We'll get there. So, uh, Jimmy, I want to start us, I want to walk us through four main questions tonight. That's really all we're going to do. We're going to walk through four main questions. And I want to start with this one. Who is Job? Who is Job? Who, th this book is named after him. If, you, if someone walked up to you on the street and they had heard there's a man named Job in the Bible and you had 30 seconds to give an answer, what would you say? Oh, gosh. Uh, he's a man from the Tiny. land of us. You say us, not us. You say ooze? I thought it was it. Like it's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? <laughs> Return of the Ooze? What is that? I don't know. Okay, okay. we're wasting your 30 seconds. No, I'm not. I, th I would actually, if I was on the street and somebody said oh, it's gosh. Ooze, I would circle circle around that. Um, so, Job. Uh, Job <laughs> uh, is, an, is an individual uh, in the Bible uh, who uh, God introduced a lot of suffering and pain to. Mm. And uh, and the watching of his story unfold is meant to um, highlight important aspects about uh, the human condition, about uh, God's sovereignty, and ultimately about his worth and worthiness of worship. And Job is the protagonist that gets us down the road talking about those kinds of things. Mm. So all you told me about Job just then is that he got introduced to suffering into his life. Yeah. And well, he's from us. If I said everything, then the episode would be over. So, you know, just I'm just trying to keep it truncated. So cool. 
I, what do you want? <laughs> no, that's great. Okay, so uh, he's from us, which is in the east. We know in that. Fact. Which we know that from the text. And uh, we learned that uh, in this, we're going to, I'm going to read part of it. Can I do that? I think that was a great start for us about who this guy is. Um, can I also just, before we even get there, can I, are you going to bring up, I just am looking at his Bible. We're such Bible nerds. And you have a note written up here. Can you explain this to me? Uh, just that the name Job means hated in Hebrew, which is an unfortunate name to have, I think. If I you're did gonna... not know that. I'm learning that right now. You know, um, my name, my legal name, James, uh, is also a kind of unpleasant name. <laughs> right. It kind of just means liar. Uh, it does. Or like uh, ankle grabber. So Job means hated. So there's that. Yeah. He's from the east, from the land of Uz, or Uz. No, it's not <laughs> Uz, to say. Just, just so we're clear. <laughs> and, and we know that some hard things happened to him. But even before that, let's. I, can I read part of the, the just the introduction of this book? Because I think it's going to help us get some context for yeah. who this guy is. And then let's talk about it. Right. There was a man in the land of Uz Thank whose you. name was Job. And the man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. So let's just, can we just stop right there? That, that tells me that Job isn't just any average kind of guy. He's righteous. He's a baller, yeah. I mean, four words are given there. Blameless, upright, feared God, and turned away from evil. To me, this even is like, he's not just righteous in his heart, like he fears God. He's turning from evil. He's, he's righteous in his actions, his hands, his behaviors, and his internal heart posture are yep. healthy and good and right before God. Yeah, you, you know, when... when Verse one of when the first thing you learn about a person are really four statements to say something really similar, like they're synonymous things. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you immediately should feel this. Oh, this is a major mm -hmm. uh, feature of this person's life mm -hmm. uh, or character that I need to hold on to. So I think the first thing that everybody should feel reading the book of Job is one thing the author wants you to know out the gate. You can't escape it. It is this. This man is a righteous man. There's mm -hmm. no debating about that. There's right. no, it, they found four ways to say it in mm -hmm. the first verse. Mm -hmm. And in fact, everything you're going to hear in really the first and second uh, chapters of this book are only reinforcing that. It, um, the relationship with his sons and daughters, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, you, yeah, uh, it comes up here just in a second. Mm -hmm. um, his sons and daughters are, he's, he's got... Um, yeah, so that's the next thing we learn about. Yeah. That he has seven sons and three daughters. That's in verse two. Yeah. So, so he's... He's fertile and right. fruitful. <laughs> fruitful yes. man. Ten children. And we know that they're young. Later in this book, we learn that they're called uh, the young. Uh, I don't remember where it says that, but uh, it says that all the young people in the house, you know, so it talks about his children as, uh, we don't know how young. They're obviously. Old enough to host parties. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so he's got a lot of children. And then we learn. In verse 3, he possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. It says, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. I mean, how much more just can this... Hyperbole, yeah. Hy yeah, hyperbole in this text. Can it tell us he's righteous, he's very wealthy, he has a lot of children, and to come back to that righteous theme with his children, mm -hmm. uh, th one of the first things we learn about him in relationship to his children is even they're, they're doing the partying thing, mm -hmm. and Job has this impulse to s make sacrifice for them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, as sort of like um, some insurance on their yeah. behavior. So, like, he's personally righteous, he's upright of heart, he's all those things, and he has a a burden even for his family that they would also be blameless before God. He's he's doing the, you know, sort of right. sacrificial offerings for them. So this is a, you're left by verse uh, five, just mm -hmm. going, this is a fantastic human being. And right. not as he only morally upright, to, to your point, he's a, he's just big time. Right. He's big time. Well, I think it's interesting that the first things we, we even have a quote here from Job in verse five. So like the w only words recorded from him at the very beginning here is it says after his children um, would have their feast days, after the end of their, their time of feasting, he would rise, like Jimmy said, offer a sacrifice. And it says, for Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. <laughs> so he has a concern for God's glory. <sighs> 
and God's righteousness. And he feels a loyalty to God so much so that if his children have cursed his God, he's concerned about that and wants to make an offering and a sacrifice for them. It says, thus Job did continually. So this isn't like a once one time thing. This is his habit, his regular rhythm of prayerfulness, intercession, making offerings for his family because of his concern for the glory of God. This is a guy who doesn't just do good things. He loves God. Yeah. And this is a huge thing to settle at the beginning of the book because everything else is built on the back of that premise. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, If you know anything about the book, you know suffering is about to come to his life in a massive, profound, you've never felt suffering like this kind of way. Mm Mm-hmm. And the question that we'll we'll talk about in a little bit, but the question that's going to be humming Mm. throughout this entire book and probably throughout your mind as you're reading even is, did he have it coming? Mm -hmm. And uh, if there's one thing that we're sure the book wants to get clear from the jump is no. The answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. He didn't have it coming. Right. Uh, And to settle that at the front is going to actually help make sense of a little bit of the whole rest of Mm -hmm. this book. Yeah. I want to make even one more comment about Job and who he is uh, by just reading a little bit of what comes next. We're going to talk more about this next week, but uh, we see right after verse five, um, (laughs) we kind of get this jump from the narrator from earth up to heaven. So this book initially has this starting on the ground level, right, with Job and who he is. And then in verse 6, our narrator takes us to a a totally different place. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And so the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said to Satan, so... (laughs) There's this whole, what's going on here? We're going to talk about that next week. What's happening uh, in the heavenlies during this whole Job thing? That's not the focus right now. We want to, this whole episode, we're just talking about what's happening on the ground level. But to answer this, who is Job? I want to bring this up here. This is verse eight. And the Lord said to Job, or, and the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Yeah. What? I just, I think you have to feel the weight of that. First of all, God says, my servant. He is possessive of Job. Mm-hmm. He is, this is my, this is my servant. Like there's pride in God's heart about Job. There's a sense of like, I love this man. Have you seen him? Hey, Satan, have you seen my guy, Job? Mm -hmm. There's no one like him on the earth. What a statement that God can make about a human being. Of the whole face of the earth, I don't know anyone like Job. And then reiterated are those same four things we just read about in the beginning, the exact same, blameless, upright, fears God, turns away from evil. So not only is this the narrator's perspective of Job, God's assessment of Job is the same. Yeah. Uh, it is, this dude is righteous in every way and I love him. I mean, there is, there is a sense of pride in, in the Lord about Job and God will later, uh, do the same thing, say the exact same phrase in chapter two, verse three, have you considered my servant Job that there is none on the earth like him? So God twice reiterates this statement about Job. And I think that's just important as we get into just this reality that God has a role in introducing suffering in Job's life, but God looks at Job and says, yes, and amen to how you're living. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's who Job is. I think that's something we all aspire to. Yeah. Which again is a tension this book is introducing. That's right. It's creating a big problem. Yes. Uh, It's creating a problem that really um, is the problem of every generation and every culture, uh, a, a misunderstanding about how God works in the world. Right. Uh, I was actually just preaching about this Sunday, mm-hmm. um, but the uh, just this, I call it payback culture or karma culture, if you will, that uh, we all live in as people. Mm-hmm. There is there is a unaided by revelation from God, um, like God correcting our thoughts about this. I think every person naturally is, uh, connects. I do bad, I get bad. Mm-hmm. I do good, I get good, and so. Out of the gate, the first the <laughs> first thing that, that you feel in the book is, oh, by the end of chapter one, my whole payback culture, karma culture thing 
is being disrupted and tested mm-hmm. because I, I have a hundred words about how fantastic, godly, upright, pure, moral, sacrificial, servant-hearted this man Job is, and everything went wrong. Mm-hmm. And all he knew for a season of his life was the worst suffering imaginable. Mm-hmm. What do you do with that? So that is that is uh, like a leading presenting tension. You're right to say yes. that. Yeah. So that's who Job is. Like that. That's a good answer for that. So here's the next question <laughs> I want to answer: Is let's talk about Job's terrible, very bad, no good day. Like you know, just the worst. So we have. Uh, what happens in day the the first bad day? Because Job actually has two bad days. Um, let's just talk about what happens in the first one. And so to get there, I do want to read a little bit of of the preamble of what gets us there. Um, after God looks at Satan and says, "Hey, my man Job, have you seen him?" Uh, there's this exchange that happens, verse nine of chapter of chapter one. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, "Does Job fear God for no reason?" Have you not put a hedge around him in his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. So Satan is looking at God saying, yeah, he loves you because you give him stuff. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only do against only against him do not stretch out your hand. So again, I, there's pride in God's heart in a, in a healthy way. No, Job loves me. <laughs> Uh, go for it. Yeah. It gives permission to Satan. So it says Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And here we get to Job's. Now that's all that what's happening in the heavenlies. Again, we're going to talk about that next week. <laughs> we're talking about what's, what's Job's experience here. Here's Job, righteous man, loves God, dedicated to God, sacrifices for his children. And then verse 13 happens. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine and the older oh, oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job. And and here is Job's day. And uh, I'm just going to read through mm-hmm. this, this day, and we're going to talk about it. So a messenger comes to Job. The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. Remember, he has 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys. So they've all been taken. All the servants struck down. Uh, with the edge of the sword. And this, this one man says, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep. You know, the uh, 7,000 sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels that's the uh, 3,000 camels, and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. I... Uh, I just the way this is written is so intentionally to just help us feel this is a fire hose of terrible loss and hardship without ceasing. One servant comes before he's even finished speaking. Another one comes with just layers of every layer of his wealth obliterated and then all the way down to his precious 10 children. This is this is day one, Job's very terrible bad day. Um, what, Jimmy, of this are we like, what do we need to pay attention to in what's happening here in this day? Like, what is the narrator trying to give our focus, get our focus on and help us feel? Well, I think that's the word. I think he's trying to uh, make us feel something. I think the, the, the thing to do with this is to as best you can experience it and it's mm-hmm. written in such a visceral way i mean it's not just data it's as he's speaking the next servant's coming i mean imagine job mm. you can almost see him like in the center and like the camera's panning around and and first servant comes and and he's giving him what has been the probably the worst news of his life like mm-hmm. my, all of my assets are gone 
in this, you know, slice of what I own. And then the camera turns and you can see another servant running in the distance and he makes it here and, and he reveals you know, another thing that you have put your stake in or could, could potentially put your stake in, your worth in, your value in, that's gone. And mm. the camera keeps paying. And each of these servants, and then the last one, it's like the thing closest to your heart, all, all of your children are gone. And uh, I think the, the appropriate thing for us to do in Job 1 is just to sit in that and to feel the horror of mm. it. Um, you almost don't even, I mean, there's not even a ton to analyze per se. It's just mm -hmm. imagine yourself for a moment. Imagine every single thing in your life virtually in an instant going away mm. and feel that. And, and not even like, I mean, going away in the worst ways. Mm -hmm. uh, what would that do to you? What would that do to your heart? What would that? Ha if you don't, if you don't put yourself in Job's place, then the shock of what's coming at the end of mm. chapter one will uh, will not pierce like it's meant to. Mm. We've got to yeah. feel this thing before we encounter what's coming. It makes me even recall to mind, and, and you may even recall to mind, like, what is the worst loss in your life up to this point? And, and how did that feel? And how did you respond then? And this is like that times 100. I think know? that is the, the thing to be grateful for in this book is it just like Solomon's experience in Ecclesiastes is the hyperbole of gain. Mm. This, this book is the hyperbole of loss. Yeah. So no one really can come to, in the same way no one can come to Ecclesiastes and go, well, he hasn't experienced this. Because mm -hmm. Solomon's point is, no, I have. I've experienced it all, had it all, done it all, achieved it all, reached it all. In the same way, I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a person who, uh, hard-pressed to find a person who could come to Job and say, well, he hasn't experienced this, though. Mm -hmm. So whatever response he's giving, it, it doesn't apply to me because it hasn't been as bad as it has with me. He's the mm -hmm. hyperbole so that uh, we could learn a lesson properly without right. um, one-upping him mm -hmm. in our suffering. Because even just without the, uh, even besides the losses of wealth and family, there's the loss or, or there's the experience of uh, something traumatic and that these all happen in the same day. Just like Jimmy was saying, like one servant comes after the other, just the, you know, uh, I, I don't know what word to use there. Just the, the stress of the day of one person coming and another, and these servants may be looking at him going, what do I do? And, these sufferings have come through attack. Uh, when we read this, the Chaldeans and the Sabaeans, two different people groups, have randomly decided to attack Job's stuff, which we know, right? We have some insight, but what would Job have felt? Why did I, I mean, what would you be thinking? What did I do to offend them? Why did they come to attack me? And then there's natural disasters. Fire fell from heaven and burned up the sheep. So you've got natural disaster, you've got tension between your neighboring people you live with and you don't know why. So even after all this moment happens, it's not like it's just and everything's lost. There'd be questions, there'd be concerns and anxieties and worries. And then what we learn on uh, on this day later is it's going to start to affect the only relationship he really has left as well. Um, it is a it is a big loss and it is the hyperbole of yeah. loss in a way that is very sobering. Which puts and he's got four. Yeah, when we get the when we get to this next point, he's got four servants left. That's it. I alone am left, and there's. I mean, the visuals. They're all standing around him yeah. because they've been interrupting each other's talking. So the visual we have is Job with four of his remaining servants after everything is lost, looking at him, probably waiting to see what's he gonna do. Yeah, and all of that puts uh, in relief the what's he going to do mm -hmm. uh, in a uh, stark fashion. Because mm -hmm. what Job does is 
Uh, one of the most uh, unintuitive things that you could write down ha- had you experienced something like this. So all of that has happened. The news has hit him, and I'll just read this. This is the response of a man who has lost almost everything but his life in a moment. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Mm. It's just a... It's about how I would respond, I think. Shocking. (laughs) Can you... Can you... I mean, like... It's 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 breathtaking. It is. It, in in as much as his his righteousness and character and wealth was so hyperbolic, and then the amount of his loss was so over the top. Too, I think this response is like, on what planet is the does this response right. exist? It's well, because what the natural human response for any of us, right? To put yourself the last time you lost something significant. Uh, it didn't have doesn't have to be on the level of this with Job, but like any type of loss, the natural inclination of the human heart is to look at God and say it's not fair. This was not it was not right of you to do this to me, and Job's response is one of you don't owe me anything. Naked, I came naked, I came with nothing. You don't owe me anything. You have the right to give. You have the right to take. Like he he looks at God without one ounce that that we see of any type of you've wronged me, you're unfair. And then the text makes it clear to us in verse 22, he did not charge God with wrong. He did not look at God and say, you've wronged me. And that is a supernatural response. I think that is just the human heart doesn't do that (laughs) uh, naturally. That's not where any of us naturally responds. And so there is something absolutely abnormal (laughs) happening. And here's one thing we have to appreciate. We're going to talk about this probably a lot this uh, season, uh, but it's worth just saying it the first time. We'll, we'll say it plenty more. Jo- this is, uh, if you noticed, um, Job did not worship God who had nothing to do with this thing. Uh, Job worshiped a God who he was completely convinced was behind right. all of the terrible things that just happened to him. Job accredits God. And he never doesn't accredit God uh, with what calamities ha- befall him in this book. Right. He, he said, the Lord gave mm-hmm. and the Lord has taken away. Now, again, we're going to probably spend a whole episode looking at mm-hmm. that. But those 10 kids, those 7,000 sheep, those 3,000, yeah, all of that... Mm-hmm. Uh, his property, his everything, the Lord gave that to me. Mm-hmm. He sees that. And here's Job's theology. Mm-hmm. Like it or not, th- this is how Job understands the world and God and, and God's relationship to the world. God took all those things away from me. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to spend a whole episode next time mm-hmm. uh, talking about the right. uh, what took place in the heavenlies that mm-hmm. had this unfold. And you, And if you know the story at all, you know... There is a role that Satan is playing in this, mm-hmm. but but uh, I find it fascinating that Job is completely comfortable saying, not even acknowledging the satanic activity in this. Which Job doesn't, we don't have any clue that Job knows about. Yeah, that's right. right? We have insight into that, but Job does not. Now, now here's what you might say if, uh, if verse 22 didn't exist. You might say, well... Here's a guy with limited knowledge. Had he known what was going on mm-hmm. in heaven, uh, he might have uh, corrected himself and said, "The Lord gives, uh, the Lord gave, and Satan took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord." Mm-hmm. Maybe Job would have said that had he, you know, had the inside scoop like we have. 
But here's what's fascinating. You read it earlier, Kel. Through all this, verse 22, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. So here's the, here's the tension we've got to manage. Here's Job's sentence. The Lord has taken away everything I have. Mm-hmm. And the sentence, Job did not blame God. Mm-hmm. Job, Job uh, acknowledges God as the doer of these things. And it is not called blame. Right. You, Christian, you need to have a category for being able to acknowledge God being the sovereign one over terrible things and also God not being at moral fault for those things. Mm -hmm. And this is a difficult tension to manage, but it is a tension the Bible is completely comfortable with, especially in the book of Job. Mm -hmm. All we're going to see over and over and over is uh, people acknowledging God is behind this mm-hmm. and nobody sinning when they say that. Right. And I don't think the modern reader, the modern Christian even, uh, nine times out of 10 uh, appreciates that. Right. I think we, we only see ju- a person saying, God this did. happened to me because of God and it's a bad thing right. as you saying something bad about God. As you saying blame, right? Mm-hmm. But it's n- but it's not. Mm-hmm. It's not. And what you have to reconcile in this book pretty early on is we have to be the type of people who can say, God is behind my worst day, and I'm not accusing God of sin in that. Right. I'm not accusing God of wronging me. Yes. Right. Um, it's a huge tension. And this isn't the end of Job's suffering. What we're going to see is in chapter 2, uh, after God affirms Job again, that, and we don't know how long these two days are apart. It just says there was another day when stuff happened. So who knows how long Job has been in grief over the loss of all his stuff and his, fa- and his children. We don't know, but we know Job will experience another day. And this is what happens to him on his second bad day. This is chapter 2, verse 7. And so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. So the past, the first bad day was all his stuff and family was stricken. That word struck is used a lot of his stuff. And here we see that striking is coming to Job's body. He is struck with loathsome sores. And then, verse 9, his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. So here now there's marital tension. He has now lost the partnership of his wife in this, uh, in the sense of like fighting to stay right with God. She's just looking at him going, Why? Why are you still doing, responding the way that you are? But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So bad day number two for Job is he has lost his health now. And he is in such pain that he is sitting in ashes and scraping his sores with broken shards of pottery. Just, I don't even know what that feels like. I mean, only... (laughs) the little bits of physical pain I have in my own life, but I do know from people that have chronic illness that they will tell me. I mean, it is like a full-time conscious job to manage manage pain and to manage the energy levels you have with it and what you can do with your day. I mean, it is like if you didn't already have enough anguish, let me introduce physical pain as well. So Job Now, if we didn't already hit the hyperbolic, the hyperbolic sense of loss for him, it has hit a new depth of affecting his very physical person on top of the mental anguish he's already in. And still, the Bible says he did not sin with his lips. It's letting us know, even though we don't see him have a moment of verbal praise to God in this moment, that Job is still uh, standing right before God at this moment. And did you feel the tension again? I mean, what what two sentences to to put together in the text? Job says, "Shall we indeed 
accept good from God and not accept evil. Evil. And then the next sentence is, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I, 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 have, I had a conversation recently uh, with a Christian who is a Bible scholar who is in many ways unwilling to admit that, uh, that something like the word evil or adversity uh, could come forth from God because, and, and he, he's not wrong to feel this, it sure sounds like you're saying God is evil and doing right. evil. But here's, here's what we know. This is where we have to harmonize the Bible with the Bible. We know that God never sins. Mm-hmm. He never tempts. He never does anything wicked. The book of James will tell us that. And yet here, this same book, the same Bible is also saying God sends blessing and he sends cursing. He sends uh, good and he sends ill or evil or adversity. And there is a way that God can do that and preserve his moral uprightness. And we're going to talk uh, at some point about how how it can be true that right. he can both do that and it not make him evil. Right. Um, and I do think there's helpful answers to give there, and we'll probably give an episode to that. Mm-hmm. So stick around for that. But again, you're just feel mm-hmm. feel your way through this text. Right. Um, the Bible is not all for your brain. It's right. for your whole person. Mm-hmm. And you're meant to experience some of the dissonance here. Um, this is a quest. This is one of the oldest books we have in our Bible. So this is a tension that has been needing to be managed for thousands and thousands of years. You're not mm-hmm. the first person to feel the what of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, that is what we're looking at here. Yeah. So this is this is the scene that is set at the very beginning of this book, like the pinnacle of righteousness. God looking at a man saying, there's no one better than him on the whole earth. I mean, this huge statement. And then he's brought to the lows of lows of just the hyperbole of loss on every level and every front in a way that it just takes your breath away. As I even think about my own losses that feel small in comparison, I just... If you've experienced that before, the loss of something that just you can't breathe through, I mean, this is a man who's living that, it's weighty. And this this is, so the last question I want to just end with is, you know, and I'll ask you this, Jimmy, is like, what is the, what's the tension that this book is setting up? What is this, this book is written so intentionally uh, by a narrator that's just setting the scene through chapters one and two to make us feel something, Mm -hmm. to make us have a question come to mind. Like, what is the tension that we start the book of Job with through this narrative? Yeah. Well, um, it it was interesting. I was in a seminary class and we were studying Job and uh, my professor said something I think really provocative and and, uh, I think I mostly agree with him. Um, But he said, you know, most people think the book of Job exists to just... uh, deal with suffering, that if you were to say, what's the main theme of the book of Job? It's suffering. And his uh, response was, I don't think that's what the main theme is. I think the main theme of the book of Job is worship. Hmm. Uh, That uh, in his uh, understanding, what Job is doing um, is putting before you this this, uh, question Is God worthy Mm. of your delight and praise and awe and worship, even if all you have left at the end is him Mm. and nothing else? And I thought that was a really compelling Mm. thing to say. But I think there's other things to say about what themes are coming up in the book of Job. But it never occurred to me that Job might actually be a book about worship. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Because what you're watching is a man stripped of everything that most people worship their God for. I worship God because he's given me wealth. Mm. I worship God because I'm in a good family. I worship God because I have blessings, and so I thank you, God, for all the blessings. But when all of those get subtracted and the only thing left Mm. in your equation is you and God, 
Is he still worthy of your worship? Mm -hmm. I think that's the the question that the book of Job is presenting. And I think that's a compelling way to think about it. Is God worthy of worship? That's right. Even when this is how uh, your life goes. That's right. I think that that I resonate with that because the book starts out with that. That's like the, the turn in the book, the first one you feel is righteous man Job suffers and he fell down and worshiped. I mean, that's the word that I think as you're reading it strikes you as what he did what? Yeah. He did what? Yeah. He worshiped? That doesn't make any sense. No one does that. Yeah. Even in my modern day of walking with people and suffering, no one does that. Very few people do that. Let's say that. Yeah. Very few, apart from the supernatural help of God, do some of fall down and worship That's in right. response. And the book ends that way. I think it's important for us to have some clue to how the book ends. Yeah, sure. We'll talk about that. But like the end of this book ends with Job's friends and an offering and an offering being made to God and intercession. I mean, like there mm-hmm. is worship happening at the end of the yeah. book. And so I do think the way the book is framed is it starts with narrative. We'll see a whole lot of discourse and poetry and dialogue in the middle, and it ends with narrative. And both those two bookends, mm-hmm. worship is central to that. And so That's right. I do feel like that makes sense of this book and is a different question to ask as we come to it is not the why of suffering, but is God worthy of worship? That's right. And, uh, you know, if you were to say this book is about suffering and the why of it, uh, you'd have a hard time justifying that because mm-hmm. one of the things you're going to be disappointed with in the book of Job, if you haven't studied it, is you're not going to come across the verse that says, and this is why Job suffered, mm-hmm. X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. So uh, one thing to just acknowledge is this this book doesn't answer the question yeah. that seems to be the question needing to be answered, which mm-hmm. is why did Job suffer if he's righteous? Mm-hmm. That's not the interest of the author of this book. Mm-hmm. But to your point, what what does seem to be their interest is what the human heart does in relationship to God when everything goes missing in their life except God. Right. And so that's mm-hmm. why I think worship is a compelling way to think about what this book is. Yeah. Yeah. So. So, okay. Until next time. Until until next time. We'll get into what happens in, in the heavenlies. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> uh, what's, that's, that's what's happening on the ground level of Job. We're going to look at this same part of the, the story next time, but from the air. What's happening in the unseen realm in this moment, and what are we meant to learn from that? That's so that's okay. next time. Thanks for joining us today, guys. We know that the book of Job can bring up some really heavy things. You know, we talked about that, that last week. That's one of the reasons it's a difficult book to study. And so if this episode and just as we get into this is bringing up some things, even in your own heart, we'd encourage you to take that to God in prayer. Uh, that's a good occasion to just not just shove that down, but actually take those things, those questions that may be brewing. Take a moment, maybe after you turn this episode off, just pause for five minutes and talk to God, start a conversation with him about the things that kind of are, are stirring in your own heart. And if you have questions about even how to do that, how to pray, how to talk to God, if you don't feel like you have a good relationship with him, send us an email. You can email us at question at clearlypodcast.com with questions about this episode, or even about what it would look like for you to engage with God with some of the heart in your own life. Um, yeah, let us know. We'd, we'd love to be a help in the journey. That's right. We film all of these before a live audience on Zoom, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. If you want to join us in real time, get your questions answered in real time, chat with us in real time, you can go to patreon.com and become one of our Patreon team members. Just go to patreon.com, search for Jimmy and Kelly Needham. You'll find us, uh, become a team member, and you can sign on with us each week as we film these things. Next time, we're doing some Q&A uh, about the person of Job, mm-hmm. his life, who he is, all of that. And uh, we hope Was you'll Job a real person? Bum, bum, bum. Mm. So, we'll get to that. Yep. All right. Bye, guys.